Yay. Thank you. Shall I share Thank my you. screen now, Shelly? Yes. Karina, it's all yours. Okay, let's see here. Let me see how we did this. Okay, I gotta do share. Okay, and then I can do this. Yeah, this is what I was getting that error, which is a drag, but I still could make it work. Okay, everybody see that okay? Yeah. I hope. Okay. Um, I just was going to say that I'm going to start by, uh, the, I'll show early work and then mid-career and then more current work. Um, this is a photo from when my Rosie's Dog Beach public art project in Long Beach was uh, installed. There'll be slides of that later. Oop, how do I get these out of the way so I can see? Excuse okay. me, Karina? Yeah? Could you give us a little bit of your background, your right. training, you know, sure. like where you learned and what sure. how you got here? Okay, oh, thank okay. you. Sure. Okay. Um, uh, okay. What happened? Why is this? I want to get rid of this stuff. So it's there. Now I can, oh, it won't go away. Oh, well. Hmm. Okay. Um, uh, my training. I have a a Bachelor of Fine Arts from Temple University Tyler School of Art in Philadelphia. And I went up to Canada after I graduated in 75 with a BFA. And I uh, was trying to make a living as an artist and got a bunch of grants from the government to do different projects in schools and some public art stuff. And that's where I met uh, Graham actually. And he's the one that said, why don't you go back to school at the University of Toronto and get a, a Bachelor of Ed degree and then you could have um, you know, a real job, like not be struggling so much. And I, I got accepted and I thought, I'm not a teacher, I don't really wanna do this. But you know, then I started to teach and then we came to California, Graham got a job down here and um, I'm from here originally and uh, so I was teaching and I decided to go back to graduate school. I actually got trained as a welder fitter also at George Brown College, paid for by the government when they were trying to get uh, welders to um, be able to make the pipeline to go from Canada down through the United States to get the oil down here. And so I was working alongside guys trained, you know, convicted felons. I had to be pretty good because they didn't know about Rosie the Riveter, but I did learn my craft. And then uh, I got, I was, um, I worked for a company. Uh, they, uh, I was looking for someone to donate materials for a big public art project I was working on. And they offered me a position selling um, the, the materials, the weld, welding rods and spray welding stuff. And so I did that and learned a lot from that as well. Uh, then Graham and I decided to come to California when he got a job down here. And I did go back and get my MFA uh, at Fullerton. But all through my time teaching, I've always been active as a pro professional artist. And when I first tried to go back to graduate school at first, they didn't want to let me. They said, you're a teacher. But then they saw my work and they, because they said, you should do a master's, not an MFA. And they saw my work and they said, well, you're obviously professional. You're you know, I managed to be active even though I was working full-time teaching. And that, that's when I got my MFA. And um, so I think that's probably just about all I need to say about all that. I think any other, uh, Karen, any questions about that? No, no. thank you. I, you know, it's always interesting to find, to see how, where you came from and how you got to where you are. Oh, sure. And of course, being a welder is a unique, um, road for an artist so i think we're all kind of fascinated by that oh well i look I've, forward to hearing seeing your work then okay well here we go all right let's see uh, why is that doing that okay sorry about that i am not that first in this okay here we go let's see okay why isn't it playing side one i did this okay i did this earlier and it worked just fine all right, let me see. Why isn't this working? OK, 
Okay, maybe I'll. So you guys see this, but you don't see the whole screen. Oh, Christ. Okay, this is freaking me out a little bit because it should work. Okay, let me see if I can reset this. Okay, I'm just gonna quit this and try and get back on here. Okay. Okay, here we go. All right, so these works are from when I was uh, studying metalsmithing at Tyler. Um, uh, on the left, it's called Rhythmic Reverberations. I was, at the time, very interested in working with artwork to, it was based on musical ideas, really, and I was interested in having your eyes hear and your ears see. I didn't know about Kandinsky at that point, but that this piece, that's what this is representing. And then the one next to it is a hookah. Um, when I was in metalsmithing, uh, the last, one of the last final projects was we had to make a, a spouted container and I did not want to make a teapot. So I, um, I decided to make a hookah. This was in 73, so whoops. I was working with all the different colored metals and things I like to do now. Carved ivory, it's made out of a, a cut die cast. It's extremely time consuming traditional metal smithing techniques where you work the metal, you heat it up to anneal it, you work it some more, it work hardens, and you can gradually shape it and it's just madness. I mean, I don't know how I ever did this. I don't think I could do these works again. Someone put a gun to my head. And the one to the right is, can you guys see your pictures at the bottom? Does, is, is that in your picture or is we that see, just mine? We just see everything. You don't see, you see, do you see yourself? Okay, so I won't worry about it because I can see that. Okay, uh, the one on the right, Ephemeral Bliss. Uh, it's um, again, there's a codalith film photo there of a waterfall that when you slide it in the top, you can see the waterfall and it's representative of the ephemeral bliss of a waterfall. It was, this was actually at the Museum of Contemporary Crafts in New York City. Marina, yeah. so what, what I, when I look at your third and fourth works on the right, I see eternal B-L-I and I don't see the S-S and so a third of the of the picture on the right is where all the attendees' pictures are. So I don't know if you can move those, but you I can't see the whole complete work. Kevin, are you on a desktop or a laptop? Because I'm you on a can. Laptop. Okay, because I can. You see should be thing. able to move your screen over so that you see more of her images. Okay, okay, very good, okay, thank you. Okay, did that help? Are you okay now? Okay, uh, this is arpeggio, again, the visual sounds. This is an installation and the idea, I wanted your eyes to hear that bum, 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 and just the whole musical visual element of a chord scale. Um, I don't know if I said, I don't think I said yet that I was playing the clarinet at eight and played very seriously and for I don't know how many years till probably 20 years ago I stopped, but I never considered myself a professional musician. Uh, I played with the principal clarinetist from the Philadelphia Harmonic sometimes, but it was all about my artwork and the visual sounds. It was a big uh, inspiration for those. Okay, now why isn't this going to the next one? Okay, all right, this is another uh, visual sound. Look at how young I was up there in the corner. <laughs> uh, adagio, um, again, a slow moving musical movement uh, installation, uh, the ACT Gallery in Long Beach. And you can see that I always have worked two dimensionally at the same time as three dimensionally and I love color. And this is a different view of the same installation. These are muted characters. Um, they are symbolic of uh, life growth. I was going through a very big life change at the time and it was reflected in my work as well as just life, the way 
the organic process of living things coming through the earth. Uh, uh, on the right side, uh, it's inside uh, the gallery, and those are different interpretations of the muted characters, fabricated steel, and galvanized. And then on the wall are paintings, um, which are on paper, large works on paper with aluminum, as well as painting and copper. And this is me working on a public art project. Uh, I was very fortunate to get the opportunity, whoops, I didn't mean to go that, there yet. Um, I got this commission and um, I was sharing a studio with a woman whose husband owned uh, a company, uh, Allweld, and he offered me the space to work on this. So that was great. It's made out of three quarter plate steel. The plate uh, weighed five tons for one of a couple of the pieces. I remember they dropped the plate once by accident and it would have been like pancake people if anybody had been around. And this is when it was installed in the schoolyard. It was for a elementary school. This is another uh, uh, project in uh, uh, Lester, uh, oh, I forget the name of the school, but anyway, it's a high school in uh, Mississauga. And again, musical wall charts that start with the traditional uh, music on the left and get progressively more uh, abstract until you have jazz on the right. For a number of years, I worked with casting faces uh, for uh, public and private work. This is a poet warrior. Um, my friend who's deceased now, Ken Wibicon, a wonderful writer I met when I lived in Vermont. And we both felt very strongly that as artists that our responsibility is to make people think and feel things when they look at our work. So I cast his face and then made it in this sculpture. Uh, Glam, Graham was really glad when I finally sold it because the boulder was like 300 pounds. And every time I showed it somewhere, he had to help me get it there. So that was funny. And then on the right is Poet Warrior Dreams. Uh, it's a digital work of art that I used part of the image from his sculpture and then some other drawings that I did to create that. Uh, what can we trust? This was actually made in 91 during the desert storm. It's amazing how pertinent it is today, I think. Uh, it's fabricated out of thin steel and then it's welded in ground so it looks like it's a big thick piece of steel. It's actually very light. And then on the right, it's a life. Uh, it's created um, the top head. Uh, I had an opportunity to take a workshop with Mark Print. And, the, it, you know, they asked for a volunteer. Anybody want to volunteer to do a head, full head cast? So I said, sure. Meanwhile, they were doing my head and I could hear them. The guys were drinking beer and stuff. And one guy's like, hey, you just plugged up her nostrils. I'm like, oh, Jesus. So fortunately, I made it through that. I came back on the plane, I had a big plaster head casting and the mold. So I had to go through the whole process of making rubber molds to get the wax to cast it. And then I made from other uh, works, I cast my face and decreased the size and then welded them all together. It's aluminum. It was quite, uh, quite something to do. I tell you, it was but the good news is it's light. It's not so hard. If it were cast bronze, I'd have to reinforce my floor for it. Although if it were bronze, I would have sold it because somebody wanted it, but it doesn't do well outside it oxidize. And here's another piece I did with that same technique, very thin sheet metal using a MIG welder around the edge and then ground off. So it looks like it's, it's, um, a solid piece of steel and th this was based on in I was doing a public art still down there a mural in Long Beach on the beach. Uh, and I was it was the summer youth employment training program I don't know if they still have it. It was at a time when they were trying to get kids who grew up in the projects to learn about working and having a job because many of them, their parents hadn't worked and they'd never seen anybody get up and go to work. So they were paid to work on a mural. So I worked with another artist. We worked on the design. We designed it and then the kids, well, they were young adults, but uh, and they, they got paid by the hour. Anyway, one of the young men, Af young African-American men, 
I remember he wouldn't let his, himself get photographed at the end because he was convinced he was going to be uh, one of 10 most wanted someday and he didn't want any pictures of himself. He was a fabulous artist. I don't know what's happened to him. But what he, he contacted me, uh, this was a couple of years after we did the mural and a friend of his had been killed by the police and he knew, he remembered me talking about my friend Kim. Karina, you just froze. Karina? Uh-oh, I wonder if it's her bandwidth. Her internet, there you go. You're back? Yeah, you're back. Okay, thank you. Anyway, he asked me, he said, your internet, that's weird. My internet is unstable because I have good internet here. Anyway, um, he asked me to get Ken to write or do something about it in his column. And Ken said that he didn't have the power. So this is what inspired me to make this, this work. I was so shocked and it's sadly, it's still a big problem today, as we know. This is a work I did after the riots and their cast hands, young people, old people, uh, children, middle-aged. And I was interested in the idea of people looking at the work and having their own experience of it. And some people, their re immediate reaction is to feel empathy, like people are desperate. And then some people are frightened, like they're afraid. They, people live in fear and that, you know, they're going to get, you know, somebody's after them. So I wanted to invite people to, again, reflect on their own lives and their own experiences to maybe really question their own belief systems about things. In the front there is the burned wood and then the, you know, the railing was kind of like a fence. Okay, so the next, these are some works that I did when I first came, I was so, they, I didn't realize it until retrospect about the um, graffiti in Southern California. And I was inspired. I did a bunch of steel paintings with words. Uh, this one is silent screen. And the other one is what ought I to do? Uh, these are some works working with the line, uh, the alternate family gates on the left. The concept is really you open up the gate and on the one side, the right side are two single men. They can be a family. The left side is a woman and child and parent. But the idea being that we need to celebrate our families and celebrate love, whatever shape it comes in, it's all good. And then on the right was a view out of my window, looking at Catalina on the top and the bottom was a, a drawing I did and interpreted it from a tree that we've just lost like within the last month um, out on our point on Point Furman. And these are some images from my Rosie Dog Beach in Long Beach. There are 19 figures. It was a public art um, project that was a statewide competition. And it was quite a challenge working with the Coastal Commission. Uh, they are uh, like no other animal. And, uh, but the, also the Arts Council for Long Beach was great. The city of Long Beach was great. And it spread out over 12, the, uh, the concept they wanted it to delineate the extra t uh, 1,200 feet that was given to the beach to extend for dogs to be allowed to roam without leashes. So yeah, it was a challenge. It took over two years but I would do it again in a beat. Public art is ridiculously a lot of work. I don't think most people make money at it, but it's an honor to be able to be given the opportunity to make artwork out where, you know, many people who see something out in the public may never have gone to a gallery or museum. So it's, it's an honor to be given that opportunity. And this is another one I did for the city of Downey, Gateway to Downey. The idea was to celebrate um, their aerospace history and the, the little shopping mall that it is shading. They wanted me to also, you know, have images about um, shopping and, you know, eating. It's a little food court and it does give uh, shade. And it also 
create shadows where people can reflect about their city. And you can see the scale by uh, the guys that are up here installing it. That was, that was something else too, I'll tell you. Uh, these are, this is a work that was one of the first ones I did after traveling to Africa on uh, safari uh, in um, Tanzania and Kenya. And I was so blown away by the wild animals. And I, I just came back and did a lot of drawings. My process is um, I'll do a drawing. It's fairly good size. I don't know, maybe 29 by 45, something like that on heavy watercolor paper. I usually use charcoal to do the drawing. I'm trying to figure out how I'm gonna make it at the same time. Then I lay it on my welding table and begin to bend the steel to follow the contours of the lines. And then I weld it on the paper once I've pretty much got it figured out. And I, um, i to take a sip of water here. Hmm. I weld it, it catches fire. I have a bottle to control the burning. And then afterwards I get to paint it. So I, it's kind of like a twofer <laughs> in one. And this is another one, uh, Animal Kingdom. Again, you know, uh, meeting uh, and spending time with people from the Maasai, the Kikuyu, and the Samburu tribes uh, was a life-altering experience for me. People that are the least responsible for climate change are suffering the most. And this was in 2017, and I know it's getting even worse now. It's, it's really shocking. Uh, Karina, I'm sorry. I have a question <laughs> regarding the process you just mentioned. This sure. is um, you said that you bend the metal on top of the watercolor drawing. I bend it and then lay it on top. It's, I bend it, go to my vise, my anvil, I go back to my drawing. Bend okay. it till it works and lay it down. Okay, and when you said what catches on fire, the, the paper. Well, the paper, when I'm, yes. that you can see the burn holes. Okay, so you then you would have two pieces, one three-dimensional and one you're drawing that has been impacted with the fire and- Right, all. and then I okay. paint it. And okay. to me, what I call them is the echo. And to me, they are like a different generation of the same work. It's almost like looking at childhood versus adolescence, adolescence and adulthood. Yes, thank you. That sure. was clear enough. Yeah, this work I did, uh, again, Amazonian atrocities in 1978. I traveled up the Amazon a thousand miles. I was in uh, Brazil, uh, Peru, and Bolivia for three months. But traveling up the Amazon and seeing it was so lush. In fact, uh, it was so like life and death, the fecundity, it, they march hand in hand. I mean, I was glad to leave. I had these seeds of something that had laid in my face. I, I mean, by the time we were out of there, I was glad, but it was still, it was beautiful. And just, I mean, the, the indigenous people, we were in this little boat coming out with these dugout pieces of wood. And I remember the uh, cook on the, the ship had, it was just a small, small ship. Um, this was before containers. So I was really lucky on the cargo ships that I rode on. I could go up and see 360 degrees of night light uh, the, um, on the on on board when when I was on the cargo ships, but the I remember the chef threw away. I remember when I was little, my mom used to buy a little, um, olive oil in a big can, um, like a I don't know it was like a rectangular with rounded edges, tall can. And he had one, and he he take taken the lid off, and he threw it out, and they were so happy to get it because it was a container that held water. So anyway, I feel very sad with what's going on there. I understand that the, you know many of the people there are just trying to make a living burning off their land, but the indigenous people are really suffering as I'm sure you all are aware of. This is another one I have done uh, about climate change after being able to go up and see the glaciers. I was so moved by how beautiful they are. That was in 2014. And I know that they're very different now. Um, there on the right, it's got a little crystal. When I did a um, big um, uh, installation video 3D project at Angel's Gate, I actually work with my nephew who is a sound artist and he helped me with the video part and making the sound because I had this, actually what happened when I remembered taking acid for the first time and being on the ocean. 
I didn't take it that many times, but I remember hearing the water and I wanted to recreate that for a background. And I thought, wow, Peter's a sound artist. So he helped me with it. So and then the crystal I found up there. So anyway, that's how this, what this is inspired from. And this one is determination. And I feel very strongly that this is in support of the LGBTQ community because they have to be so courageous and determined to acknowledge their own voice, find their own voice and be brave, have courage and determination. Um, the, the, on the left, it's um, uh, Mira. Um, it's funny because one of our uh, critique mates, it was Ashton Phillips said, you know, you work with reflection so much. And I, on the gl other glass pieces from earlier works, I thought, wow. So I got inspired to start working with mirrors more. So that's what this is. It's a piece of wood. It's actually got filigree around the edge too. You can't really see that, but mirror. And then again, the echo on the right. And this I did, webs, the webs of life. This is during the pandemic. That's Graham's hair. He did a big whack job on himself. He, he's gotten pretty good at cutting his own hair. I'm, I'm impressed. But I had a big pile of, of this hair. And I thought hair is like webs of life and just realizing how fragile life is. And so the time is so short. And yet we try and pack as much as we can into it. My original drawing, I was going to put a lot of like webs. I thought it was too busy on the steel. So I let go of the other line works. And then this is courage and courage echo. This, the idea of the head with the glass is really like a man to me that has all of these feelings that he's stuffed in himself. And then he just has to blow and just has to have the courage to just let it go. He's a vessel. If you see the neck going down, he's a vessel. And then he just blows it and just, just lets it out. And um, these are some uh, works I've been experimenting with the resin. Uh, fragmented, again, I just have felt like all of us are so fragmented right now it, during COVID and just the politics feels very, very fragmented. And then on the right, family tree, I actually work with these little tiny, uh, the faces. When I taught digital art, one of the things I taught was digital art and I had my students uh, do a photo repair and then they had to make a small image that I could, I turned it, I, I fused it. I beg your pardon? Let me have a question. No? Okay. I, um, I fused it in glass and made little medallions. So it's, that's why it's called family tree, that we're all like family tree here. And then we are family. That's the same thing. These were the works that these kids never picked up. That's why I still had them. I thought I could incorporate them. And I just thought they were so darling. And they are, we are family, we're all family, we're all the human race. And if everybody realized that, we would have so much fewer conflict. Uh, broken dreams, just making something beautiful when things don't work right the way you want them to. Um, just making something beautiful out of it. And then Aussie Earth, I had an emu egg because my husband's Australian and my eldest sister married an Australian before I did. Bless her heart, she took a a ship over when she was 21 and like, I don't even know, was it 1960, 61 to Australia? This is, we had big reel to reel tapes that we would tape talking to each other and send, nobody used the telephone. Anyway, we go and visit because we both have family there. And I had an emu egg that got broken. So I wanted to make artwork with it. So those little red things, they're, in Australia, all the eucalyptus trees are just called gum trees. So we have some gum trees here, and those are like little eucalyptus gum nuts right here. And then I put some of my hair in here too, and just had fun with it. The, the rim, the, the edging is from a, our roll-up door, the big steel door. Um, it, it broke and I figured out how to use it as a frame, so that worked. So. I think that's the end. Is that the end? Yeah, I think, let me see, is there one more? No, I think that might, I wanted to put one of the, um, my most current one, but okay, I'm gonna exit full screen, I guess. Okay, and uh, go back to chime, uh, let me see, how do I do this?
Um, I'm going to go Can back. I stop sharing. Are you, do you have anything else you want to share, show us? Well, I thought I might just uh, do, if I shared and then I could walk around the studio really just to show the studio and, and, but I don't know if, do I stop sharing to do that? Don't I? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So stop sharing. No, just oh. yeah, stop sharing your screen. Okay. I do it then. <laughs> yeah, you, you stop share. Okay. Let me see. You are screen. Okay. I see it. Stop share. Okay, got it. Okay, now so I want to put us on speaker. So everyone should put them on speaker view. And then you could walk around your studio because Karina's studio is amazing. Okay, but how do I do that to make it so they can see it? This okay, is just hang on. We can see you. We, oh, up in the okay. right -hand you're, going, corner. you're going you're going to uh is, are you on a laptop or are you just gonna take that around? Yeah. And other people, you can either stay on mute or you can pin her square. You know, those little, those three little dots when you hover over her, click on pin, and then you will see only her, even if other people are talking. Okay, so here is my um, downstairs studio for my uh, metalworking sculpture area. Uh, big roll up door. I don't know if that, I don't know if I'm doing that right. Yeah, and we can see it. And this is a gallery area full of stuff, <laughs> like most of us. And some more. You're fine, Karina. Just slow down a little bit. Oh, okay. It'll make people dizzy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. And this is my drawing and painting area. We managed to get this uh, double lot for $50,000 um, because it's right next to Sunken City and next to a landslide. So uh, we really lucked out. Uh, and so the bottom part is made out of- Rena, Yeah? You know, show them the ocean view from your windows and you okay. are going still, I think, too fast. Oh, okay. All right. Well, anyway, this- Not is everybody knows where Sunken City is. Okay. This is um, 2,500 square feet uh, that we have made out of recycled styrofoam and cement. And then on top, we have a manufactured home, which it brings trailer trash to the new level. It's pretty uh, dark outside. <laughs> I don't know if you can see out. <laughs> <laughs> Mitzi knows, she lives right next door. That's <laughs> ridiculous. Yeah, it is ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now her place is just breathtakingly amazing. Oh, yeah. amazing. So Thank you. Oh, I wanted to show you the one I just finished. That's what this is right here. It's an homage to the tree that fell that we love oh. so much. Oh, oh, that's beautiful. Thank you. Oh, well, I want to thank you all so much for coming. And my God, any questions, please do not hesitate. Wow. I really appreciate you giving me the time. I know mm. how busy everybody is. Where is Sunken City? It's um. Do you know Do you know Angels Gate Cultural Center? Yeah. Point Furman. Yeah, Point Furman. It's right down. The, if you just keep going instead of turning into Sunken City, you go down the hill, and that's where it is. It's right there at the park. Oh, Grandma sure. wanted me to show sure. you this too. This is the, I don't know if that shows or not. Did I do that? Yes, you can, no. we can see that. Okay. This is the little uh, container anyway. Oh, no, you got to put it down if you want us to oh. see. Okay. Angle the camera down a bit. Oh, okay. Like that? There you go. Okay. Oh, we're anyway. only seeing part of it. Oh, okay. Well, you saw it already. That's all right. Oh, there oh, it is. There okay. it is. But, you know, one of the reasons that I stopped with metalsmithing is the scale was too small. Mm. I wanted to be, yeah, I don't want to work a thousand hours on something that you can smash with your foot. And uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot easier welding than soldering this stuff, a lot easier. So anyway, does anybody have any questions? Well, I'm going to stop sharing, okay, so we can all. Okay. Um, I have a question. You yeah. can sure. remove your pin now. I move my pin? I'm saying, I'm telling oh. people, they can remove their pin okay. and go back to gallery view. So now we can go to gallery view. So um, thank you so much, Karina. We have 
We have some questions. Okay, sure. Okay. May I ask a question? Sure, Nancy was first, I think. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Okay. Um, so the piece where it's a woman and it's your head molded and then mm -hmm. all the other faces, yeah. how, when you do something like that, because it looks pretty tall to me. It is. It's pretty tall. Well, it's about, I don't know, five and a half feet, something like that. So is part, Life size. Of, is part of what you learned how to, I mean, what do you do? Do you draw it out first? How do you, how do you design it so that you know it's all going to stand up right? Well, when I did well, that piece, I, I didn't know for sure what I wanted to do with it. But I, I, to be honest with you, I was just turning 40 and it was the first time I realized that it's not the same for women as men. Cause I had a twin brother. I was always treated. I was a tomboy and I was angry about it. I've never told anybody that, but that's really part of what the inspiration was. So I just felt like it's not the same for women as men. And I just really was so, but it's also about a tree of life. Like the hands are like roots. And um, so what, what I did, I, I, as I said, I got the opportunity to get the head um, you know, do the workshop. And so I made the head and I wasn't sure how I was going to build it, but, oh my God, Graham's just brought it. Oh yeah. Yeah. They, can, <laughs> they saw the picture already. <laughs> they saw it already. Oh, Graham. <laughs> <laughs> Good on you, Graham. Oh, Good Graham. on you. Thank you. <laughs> we we like the visual. <laughs> yeah, it has Nancy Weber's hands in the bottom. But anyway, what I did in answer to your question, Nancy, was I, um, it was really, I really like casting is a pain in the ass. Unless you have money, you pay somebody else. I had a foundry for a while. It's way too much work pay somebody else, forget about it. But anyway, um, I built like a structure with two by fours and chicken wire and sort of just started to figure out how I was gonna weld it and put it together on that. But welding aluminum, a lot of people think you can't weld. The thing about aluminum is that the oxide on the outside of the metal melts at a higher temperature than the actual metal. So by the time you start to get that broken through, the metal falls and it just, so you have to have the right alloy that breaks through the oxide so you can weld it. So it was tricky. It was, you know, but, you know. You and if I can interject one moment, each of the shrunken <laughs> heads, she made a mold, shrunk the mold, made a mold of the shrunken mold, shrunk the mold. Yeah, it was a lot of so work. So these heads, <laughs> what? I don't 30, know. 40 hours to I, do? I, I don't know. I, you know, you don't <laughs> think we just do what we do. But I don't know, did that answer your question? Yes, yes. thank you very much. Thank you're you. Welcome. You gotta let somebody else sing your praises, Karina, <laughs> if you're not gonna do it. Thank you, Graham. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So I have a question for you, yes. Karina. So, so at the beginning of your presentation, you were showing a lot of uh, public sculptures that you were uh -huh. doing. And then you, and now these are more private works that you're doing. So right. which, which ones do you really prefer to do? And how are you getting, are you uh, actively pursuing more public sculptures and- Public art, it, yeah. I, you know, I try, it's hard to get. I mean, there's a lot of competition out there. Um, I, if I, they, you know, it's, I had somebody approach me about doing a dog park after he saw my work, after he saw my work in, um, you know, Long Beach, Rosie Dog Beach. And he was all a, a gay, go for it, go for it. He loved, he wanted me to do it. But I'm like, I'm not gonna work on it until I get a contract because I've had that opportunity. People want me to do stuff. And then you find out that they didn't have the authority and you put all this work out. And so anyway, he, he the, I think the project's going, they're not even gonna do that. But so that's what happens. You try, I've sort of begun to think, I don't know if I, it's so much work to put this stuff together. If you do a proposal, and then you get through the next step and you're really thinking you're going to get it and then you don't get it. But you know, I, I, I mean, I'd do it again if I had it, but it's very much like choosing apples over oranges. I mean, I, I yes, especially when you have like uh, city councils that have to approve it. And then you've got like one holdout and, and oh, even yeah. I, there, there was an artist that had contract they it was approved and so forth and then one person yeah uh, managed to kick it out and she yep. lost the whole thing so it is difficult but the work that you've done already is just amazing 
Oh, yeah. thank yeah. you. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you guys. You're kind. Thank you so much. Yeah. Oh. So, Kri Kri I wanted to, to yeah. ask you, I was curious about your, the time when you were exploring or sharing about the travel uh -huh. and the cargo ships. Now, was that in the sort of the 2000, 12, 13, 14 time of your other travels, or was that much earlier? 1978. Okay. And then to that point, because when you spoke of Kenya in 2017, yes. um, when I was in college, I had the opportunity to go to Kenya in 1966, when it was two wow. years, a new country. Wow. And wow. so I was there with a college group and we were, you know, very multicultural. We did these work projects, but even there in that scenario, still the, the Maasai, we worked, we were in a Kikuya village, but oh. just, I've also had the opportunity and it more recently to travel it, on some things in which, you know, there's a good deal more um, ease, <laughs> shall yeah. we say. And, okay. and sort of how you found yourself traversing to that empathetic point of view with those who are there um, when you're in that more, um, sort of supported travel than you have when you're in your in, in your 20s or something well I found you know the the people I I can I had a connection I don't know if I was a warrior in earlier uh -huh. life. okay there was a tremendous connection that I had there and they took me in the little tiny huts and explained to me how they um this one woman that they had the cow and they kept it on the side of the hut in yep. a little like a the um they had briar bushes to keep it and they bled it they made cheese and that they ate they ate that they didn't kill the animal they didn't eat meat in right. fact they could travel at night with the lion they never got attacked they they it's like the animals knew that they weren't going to eat them and they right. didn't get attacked and i i just I, but they were telling me how they had a hard time getting enough grass to feed the cow and they, and I've read recently that a lot of them are going to have, they, they can't keep their cows fed and then they have to change their l lifestyle for thousands of years. They've been doing this and it just breaks my heart and they're starving, people starving. This one young chief, he said, I have nine kids. I'm thinking he's not old enough. And then he explained that one, one woman, one mother had died and they're his kids now. And that, you know, she starved. I mean, it's just horrible. It just breaks my heart. I just don't understand so anyway, that's been a, a source of some work that I've done. Thank you for sharing that. Not sure. Anybody else have questions? Hi, Jenny. Quick hey, question. girl. So good to see you. Oh my God, yeah. Spencer and Sydney. You guys have grown up so much. It hasn't been that long. Oh my gosh, it's so great to see you. <laughs> hope you're going to come down for Thanksgiving. Sure. Hope, 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 hope. <laughs> All right. So we have a question. Sure. How do you encourage an 11, almost 12 year old artist City. to pursue oh, art to spend time schools are killing art? Okay. You, you cut out there a little bit. Mm. How to pursue art when schools are killing art? Oh. Well, not all schools How are. How do you encourage middle school kids like this one? When, well, a lot of their schools are killing art. How do you encourage yeah. them to pursue it? Especially when their mom doesn't want them to make too much mess. <laughs> oh, well, that's a challenge. Go outside and make all the mess you want. But I will tell you, everything you look at anywhere, anytime had an artist involved. So let me tell you a quick story. A friend of ours, their daughter, they were so worried about her wanting to be an artist. I tutored her when she was a little girl. She's so talented and so smart. She went to the Art Institute of Chicago. She got a job right out of art school, working for Mattel, starting at 60 grand. She's now getting 80 grand. And they even offered to pay her tuition if she wants to go back to graduate school. Hmm. Let me tell you, don't think for a minute that Sydney wouldn't be able to make a living. And also, if you have to do art, you have to do art. It's a curse sometimes, damn inconvenient. But we have to do it to stay <laughs> healthy and happy. And the rest of it is just how to. Yeah. And Sydney, I love, I love that you're so passionate about art. I look forward to painting with you when you come down. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. 
Adorable. Oh, precious. Well, thank you so much, Karina. Um, oh, my God. So I have a, just an informational sure. question. Where mm -hmm. did you do your welding and where did you do your casting? Okay, well, um, my welding, I got trained as a welded fitter at George Brown College in a program paid for by the government in Canada. I do my welding in my studio for myself. As far as public art, I had contractors. I did all the design work on the computer. Uh, but I worked, um, I can't even think of the guy's name now. I don't even know if he's still doing it because it was 2014, 15. But he was a graduate of Long Beach. If you want, I can find out. He was talking about going into designing drains to cut out with laser cut because it was, it's hard. You can't guarantee. Uh, I don't think he'd ever done a public art project for someone. Uh, the casting, I haven't done casting for a while. I did a lot of my own casting. I had a foundry uh, at my house when I lived in Long Beach. And when I was in school, I did it. And there was a foundry, Crystal, um, Crystal Marvel. <laughs> He still may, bless you, he may still have a foundry in Long Beach, I mean, Los Angeles, that he does casting, but I think he may have retired from that by now. But I mean, there are, there are foundries around, but I don't really, casting is just prohibitively expensive. It's too expensive. And I found I didn't want to do that work anymore anyway. But well, it's very impressive. It's very oh, hard thank work, you. I know. Yeah, it is. Very yeah, when I had a shell, um, ceramic shell, Foundry, and if you make one mistake and you lose that slurry, there goes all your recording. What's that? Somebody said something. But feedback, I don't know. just feedback. Oh, okay. Okay, so yeah. All right, so thank you so much, Karina. And I want to let thank everyone you. know that Carrie Smith, who is here, hi, Carrie, and she Karen. will be presenting her work. Um, on the 15th at 7 p.m. So uh, I know it's, you know, some of you, I wanna apologize. I got uh, the emails just like while I was on the Zoom. So if you want to join, please email me a little bit before <laughs> uh, the day, 6.30, before 6.30, so I can get you the link. I don't post the link, um, I could do an invite. Um, I don't want to have any bombing. <laughs> no, there's just feedback. Yeah. Um, so if if those of you who are still here who are here would like to join, I will put you down and just send you a link for uh, next month on the 15th. I definitely want to see it. Okay. Me too. Me too. Okay, so I'll just automatically send you the link. It's actually the same link. It's the same link every uh, Thursday. Oh, just just okay. FYI. I'll have it then. Okay? Every, every third Thursday. So well, I want to thank all of you for the time because I know nobody wants to sit on their butt and look at a computer, <laughs> but it's the best we can do today. And there are silver linings. I mean, I haven't had an opportunity or been invited to talk about my work like this. And I, you know, you don't get this time in an opening. With people, yeah, so that's we have true. To look at the at the silver linings, mm -hmm. but I do really sincerely thank you so much for making the effort to come. It means a lot to me. Okay, and, and we can we can tell how committed you are, and that's really uh, inspirational. Oh, well, thank you. It's called "Don't Have Any Choice." <laughs> well, <laughs> bravo, bravo, I feel bravo, all about. bravo! We want to be happy. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. You. All right, I'm going to go get that stiff drink now. <laughs> Thank you so much. Everyone, have a great night. Bye. 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 Bye.